Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I would just like to remind the winners of the consolation prize that out of the 15 of you, only five have actually gotten in contact with me. In order to check if you were a winner of the consolation prize, I have pinned the names of those of you in the comments section. So please have a check and see if you've won. Get in touch with me via email within the next two days and information will be provided on how to claim your prize. But anyway, for now I would like everyone to get comfortable because we're going to venture to the middle of nowhere to let the darkness take control. I am not easily spooked. It takes a lot to throw me off balance. But the story I'm about to tell really did shake me up and left me wondering if it's ever really going to be over. I'm a 29 year old single woman. My career has been my main focus. And as a result, I've been successful at what I do. I am a safety consultant. I love the irony. And I go to people's homes or workplaces to improve their safety. Maybe it's my profession that made me feel like nothing bad would ever happen to me. Spotting risks and dealing with them is what I do best. It started off innocently enough. The first time I remember seeing him was when I was stuck in traffic and he was the driver in the car behind me. I saw him in the rear view mirror and he was smiling and doing a what can you do about it gesture. He had snacks and a thermos and started making himself comfy in the car. He seemed like a relaxed kind of guy. The cause of the traffic block was an accident and we were stuck for a long time. I guess that's why I remembered his face and his car so well later. So anyway, a bit after in that same week, I was on my way home from work, which is about a 20 minute drive. And I spot him in his white Volvo behind me once more. I make my way through town and he is still behind me. At this point, my overtly risk calculating mind tells me not to go straight home. I was not feeling threatened or scared, just mentally making notes that this man seems to drive the exact same route as I do. I stop at the coffee shop and set off on a mission to feed my caffeine addiction. And when I come out back, I had almost forgotten about the Volvo until I stop at the last red light before reaching my street and I see him behind me once again. I wondered if he wanted to ask me something. As I got out of my car, I had my pepper spray ready in my pocket just in case. But the Volvo drove straight past me and the driver did not even look my way. I'm just being overly paranoid then I thought. My co-workers said it would happen if you stayed in the business for too long. Fast forward a few days. I was working late one night and suddenly got a text message. I got the kind of alarm system at my house that will send you a text if anyone tries to get in or tampers when the alarm. I hurried home to check but found nothing out of order. A case of malfunctioning maybe? The next morning, my boss phoned me and asked if I wanted to go meet with a client out of town. He had asked for me, a recommendation from another client. Flattered and eager to land a new big client, I agreed. 
Since I have zero talent for map reading and finding my way, I used the GPS in my phone to get the address right. The longer I drove, the less eager I became. The risk calculator in my mind woke up, pointing its index finger at the things that didn't totally make sense. Why did the client say no to the normal process? A telephone contact to discuss the situation and get a picture of what it is that we can do and what it would cost in order for us to get involved. Why a meeting right away? And without giving any details about what sort of property it was. I stopped the car and considered the situation. Was I overthinking it? Had I started to become really paranoid without noticing? Or was there something strange about this? I decided that I was probably seeing patterns that weren't there. And I went ahead to find the address. It was hard as the GPS on the phone stopped working, with no service out here in the middle of nowhere. As I saw the property, I got a strange feeling again. It didn't look like a place that anyone would invest any significant amount of money to protect. It was an old building, old tires, and junk scattered around the yard, and nothing of value anywhere to be seen. Who would want to go out of their way to protect this? Following my instincts, I drove around the property to the back of the building and I didn't see anyone around, which added to the growing feeling of get the hell out. As I drove around the corner, I saw a tarp covering a car. The tarp was too small to cover the whole vehicle, and I immediately recognised the shape and colour of the white Volvo. I locked the doors and started to turn the car around, and suddenly there he was, blocking my exit. He was dressed in a suit that looked like it had seen the light of day when his grandpa was younger. He wasn't smiling anymore. Not looking like a nice, relaxed guy. He was looking nervous and strained. He started walking towards me, and I could see that he was wearing thick leather gloves despite the hot weather. I looked for an alternative way out. Because, let's face it, you don't want to run a person over if you can avoid it. It would be hard to claim self-defence without any harm done to me. Maybe he was just a socially challenged person, who didn't know how to show his interest in a normal way. Come on out, he said, with his voice sugar sweet, but his face showed no emotion. Get out of my way. I said, opening the window a small amount. I just want to talk to you. Please shut off the engine and talk to me. I made scones especially for you. I just want to chat. Saying this, he looked very sad and defeated and lonely, and I almost fell for it. What if he was just really lonely, and wanted to invite someone over and had no idea how to do it? The gloves, the hidden car... The alarm system at your house? My inner voice reminded me. Please don't be mad. I just wanted to surprise you. Don't you like surprises? All the magazines say that you should surprise your lady with spontaneous romantic things. And I cooked. Just for you. Please at least let me show you the decorations I made. Please? He thinks I'm his girlfriend? Holy shit. Okay. I smiled. I understood. You spooked me at first, that's all. But I recognise you now. I'll just park the car on the front yard, and then we can go have scones. The moment I finished my sentence, he started shaking his head. No, no. Park here, it's okay. Okay, I said. Still smiling as convincing as I could 
turning off the engine. Then I started pulling at the locked door, pretending it was stuck. Oh my god, the door is doing this again. <sighs> Damn it, I meant to get it fixed, but I never had the time to take it to the garage. You know what it's like, right? Maybe you can do it for me someday, sweetie. He nods happily and runs up to the car to help me with the door. He pulls downwards and gives it a really hard yank. I instructed as I slowly moved my hand into the ignition. I got the car going, with him still holding onto the door for dear life. He cried and screamed and kicked as hard as he could, but he had to let go. And I drove home, constantly looking back in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see the Volvo. As I stopped at a gas station, I phoned the police and my boss, and I started to feel sorry for him. How sad a life he must have had. The police arrived at the location, but the Volvo man wasn't there anymore. Turned out, he didn't own the place either. It was all a lie. They did find a table set for two, with roses and scones and now cold tea. They also found a box in the bathroom containing duct tape, cuffs, a woman's nightgown and a jewellery box with an engagement ring. In the kitchen, they found in an old bread box photos that he'd taken from the car and photos of my house. I don't know if this is all over or if he has found someone else to propose to or if he is planning to try it again with me. I have since started to bring my gun to most places, and if he does try again, I will be ready. A part of me feels very sorry for him for being so at odds with the rest of the world. Another part, my inner survivalist, is ready to take him down the moment he suggests we have scones and tea again. Despite a few creepy instances as a child, there has only been one time in my adult life that I have truly felt primal fear. I live in a village in the middle of the English countryside. To paint an accurate picture of its size, it has a population of 4,000, but it feels more like 1,000 due to its spread of nature and being surrounded on all sides by lots of fields, farms and woods that eventually connect onto a pretty famous forest. It's kind of on the middle of nowhere and because of this it has notoriously bad phone and internet connections. Having lived here all my life I know the place like the back of my hand. I know where all the public footpaths through the woods and fields are, and where they connect to, and where to cross deep streams. I have gone on walks in this area throughout my childhood, with parents and alone as an adult. Nothing bad has ever happened, and I felt safe here. This story takes place last summer in July, after I moved back home from university, I had yet to get a job and smoked a lot of weed. A habit my parents despised, and which I tried to keep hidden from them by going for evening walks. Multiple pre-rolled joints hidden away in my hoodie pocket. As usual, this day they both got home at 5pm. We had dinner, but chatted for a while longer than usual, as my mother had quite a hectic day and was telling me all about it. Because of this, I ended up heading out for my walk an hour later than routine, about 7pm. But as it was summer, the sun was still shining. So honestly, I didn't really notice that it would start getting dark while I was still out. 
the woodlands closest to my house, are less than five minutes away, and you enter through a gate into a farmer's field. You can see across the open area quite far, until the first set of small woods obscures your view. That is where I was heading, and I knew this track takes under two hours, and leads back onto the same path I was standing on now. More than enough time to smoke three joints in my pocket, and for the smell to leave my clothing. This entire area is very popular for dog walkers, so it's not unusual to see other people while you are about, and, as this is a village, everybody says hello to everybody. I lit my first joint, and I started walking. I'm just in my own world, until I was less than a hundred feet before the entrance of the woods. At which point, an elderly man was coming out of them, throwing a ball for his border collie. I finished my joint and stubbed it out, and as I got closer, I recognised it as John, who lived on the road next to mine, and knew my grandpa. We stopped said hello, and I stroked his dog, Max. While talking, I see another man coming out of the woods. No dog, just a bright green jacket. Very tall. And he had a good ten years on me age-wise. Me and John chat for just another minute and say goodbye. He warns me not to stay out too late, as it was getting dark. True, the sky was now a bright pink and orange, and the sun was indeed beginning to set. I hadn't really noticed. I continued on down the path towards the man, where we went nearly passing each other. We did make brief eye contact, smile and said hello like everybody else does. When my eyes met his, he was already looking at me. His dark eyes locked on mine, and he wasn't smiling. I didn't know him at all, but I knew something was wrong. It was in his eyes. I swallowed my politeness, and looked at the ground as we passed. I had lived in my university city for the past couple of years, so I knew a red flag when I saw one, and my country bumpkin manners evaporated. I quickened my pace a little, and before entering the woods slyly, I looked back. The guy was still walking in the same direction following John. I felt relieved, laughed, cursed the weed for making me paranoid, and, as expected, lit up another, and started walking deeper into the woods. It takes about 30 minutes to follow the path through the woods to the end. The pathway exit opened into another field that led to another set of woods. The sky was now violet, the dimming light having been obscured to me by the trees. I was already smoking my last joint, and was near the entrance of the second set of woods when I felt it. Fear. Complete, crippling fear. Absolute fear and it worked its way like electricity through every layer of my flesh. I'd never felt anything like it before or since, but I knew what it was, and I whipped around. Standing at the exit of the first set of woods was the man. I could still make out his green jacket in the fading light. He's doubled back, and very quickly too, I thought. I had looked back several times while in those trees, and he hadn't been there. For a second I froze, as did he. He knew I'd seen him. To sprint the distance between us would take him about five minutes, and he was obviously in good shape. I threw the spliff and bolted into the woods. The only way I could go, and I didn't dare look behind me. I sprinted for a couple of minutes before taking a sharp left turn off the path into the trees, hoping to throw him off a bit, 
and I couldn't see a bloody thing. The light was already darkening, and the trees made it a hundred times worse, especially as I was now in the thick of them, their branches catching on my clothes like fingers, whipping and scratching my bare legs, and I bled as I ran. My lungs protested in pain, hating me for smoking so much, while my heart was throwing itself against my ribcage trying to escape. I couldn't anymore. I threw myself on the ground behind a particularly thick trunk, my back against it, knees to my chest, hand over my mouth to stifle my laboured breathing. Desperately, trying to pump air into my lungs for the next sprint. I listened for the first time, and a few seconds passed silently. Then I heard him. The sound of heavy footfalls and snapping twigs were prevalent, and he was about twenty feet to my left. I dare not look in case he sees me. I have my phone, but I knew that there was little chance of getting signal where I was. I knew he would either hear me talking or see the light from the display. I'm not ashamed to say it, but at this point I started to cry, the tears falling silently down my cheeks. What the hell? I hear a deep voice say. Where are you? I know you're here. I saw you. I have to clasp both my hands across my mouth to stop my screams escaping. I can hear him moving around, and I panic, and I find enough courage to slowly peek from behind the tree. He was about ten feet behind me, less than twenty feet to the left, with his back to me. I moved back, and my eyes searched the area around me. I picked up a pretty heavy rock, and I carefully checked on him again. His back is still turned, but he's searching through the trees, hunched down lower to the ground now. And I make a snap decision, and with everything I had left, I threw the rock behind me and to the right. It clattered through the branches of the trees, and made one hell of a noise. I watched him immediately bolt in its direction, laughing. I paused a little, hearing his footsteps get quieter, until I thought I wouldn't be so visible to him. So I moved and threw myself forward, and ran, putting as much distance between us as possible. But I was also aware that I was getting further and further away from home. I knew there had to be a stream somewhere close. If I found the stream, I can follow it, as it borders the land and runs parallel to some of the footpaths. So I ran, and I ran, and I ran, until the trees finally cleared, and I can just make out another field through them on the other side. I thanked God, and pushed myself a little bit further, till I'm out of the trees, and the ground disappeared below my feet and I go head over heels into the stream embankment. I crash into the water below, my mouth open and my lungs filling with muddy water. As I splutter it out, I feel both relieved to have found the stream and terrified he's heard me. My phone is now ruined. I slowly make my way downstream as quietly as possible, listening out for him the whole time, as the stream borders the woods, looking up periodically just in case. After a while, maybe half an hour, I notice the trees begin to thin out, and realise this is the edge of the woods where I would have been exiting, where the pathway is connected to the original one I'd started on. If I ran, I could get home in less than 20 minutes. As quietly as I could, I dragged myself on my stomach, back up the embankment army style, wanting to stay as low as possible. I peeked over the top, 
and I could just make out the opening of the woods exit path about 50 feet away. I scanned the forest line for a couple of minutes, my eyes trying to make up movement. Despite it being pitch black, nothing. I couldn't hear anything either. I pushed myself and sprinted as fast as I could across the field onto the pathway. I knew the gate I'd entered through was in the adjoining field, and it wasn't really that far. I was so happy. And then I heard a scream fly across the field. You bitch. And I swear my legs nearly gave out there and then. He had been waiting for me. I turned my head and saw him sprinting out of the woods at full pelt. I screamed and pushed myself further, tears coating my face. All I could do was run. I crossed into the main field, and now I could see the moonlight shining off the metal gate. My house was just five minutes away after that. I have never focused on anything as much as that gate. He was faster than me, and getting closer screaming at me the whole time about he was going to slit my throat. I ran and ran, pushing myself up and over the gate, and I ran up the road. I dared look as I made the turning for my road, and he was still following me. I raced up my driveway and threw myself at the door, running into the living room, crying and screaming hysterically pointing behind me towards the door. My dad ran outside, while my mum grabbed a hold of me, as I was collapsed and shaking. As it turns out, my parents had already called the police. As I said I was going out for an hour or so, and that was at seven. And with it being well past midnight, and I hadn't answered the phone, it was very unlike me. We called the police again to explain. They came and I gave a false statement. Both my parents and the police were horrified. Nothing like this happens here. There hasn't been a report of rape or murder in the last hundred years. But one look at me, and it was obvious I was telling the truth. I was covered head to toe in cuts and bruises, soaking wet and covered in mud and blood. I wouldn't go into how this experience changed me. It's depressing. But I will say, the thing that scares me the most is that they never even had a suspect. Despite him following me so closely, he was gone by the time my dad ran out. That guy is still out there. And who knows what he's really capable of. There used to be this old quarry that we would go to in high school to just jump off the cliffs. It was lots of fun. Anyway, it was in a fenced off area of land that was roughly 400 acres. Not normal wood fence either, like a big chain fence. The place had several abandoned boarded up homes in it. And we decided to start exploring these one day before we went swimming. We went into the first house and didn't find anything. It was really dark inside and we didn't have flashlights. So we moved on pretty fast. We drove further down the road and that was when it started getting weird. There was an old barn there, so we decided to explore it a bit. There was all kinds of stuff spray painted like this is hell and the devil lives here. Nothing too off putting, but it changed the mood a bit. I walked into one part of it. And there were these large pools built up and made with black tarps and cinder blocks. They had only one small opening. So you really couldn't tell what they were. But they were pretty freaky. That was about the time I heard my friend screaming in the back room. I ran back and just saw him standing there, pointing, saying shit over and over again. I looked at him where he was pointing at, and there, sitting in the middle of the room, in this abandoned barn, 
was an electric chair. It had thick leather straps for the wrists and ankles, and some big metal thing that goes over your head. It looked like there were more rooms behind this one. But we had only looked at one level, and we got the hell out of there after that. I was driving with my buddy in the middle of the outback of Australia, in a camper van that we were living out of for the past month. Now in the outback, there are really, really long stretches of road that just go straight for kilometer after kilometer, and a whole lot of nothing, and you can see for miles and miles. We were driving from Cobar to Broken Hill. And the thing about driving in the outback of Australia is that it is the Wild West and well known for serial killers. And I remember we came over one hill and just saw the strangest cloud formation on the horizon. And we just kept getting closer and closer. This was fun. Because when there isn't much to look at, a giant black cloud during sunset was pretty sweet. So this cloud was forming out of nowhere, and it kept getting bigger. And suddenly we saw it. It was a huge fire. I drove as fast as my 1982 Toyota Hiace could drive. And all I could think of was, oh crap, people must be in trouble. We get a bit closer and we realise that it's not one fire, but two. And I pushed my van as hard as I dared. We finally got close enough to see a bit more of the picture. And it was these two extremely large trees, over a hundred years old, which makes no sense in the middle of the outback. And they were both completely engulfed in flames. But this isn't even the weird part. As we approached there was a station wagon. In the ditch that runs along the side of the road, with its lights on and the engine still running. By this point, we had rolled up to the scene and noticed people in normal clothes standing and staring at the tree fires, while a man with, I assumed was a Bible, preached at them with very fire and brimstony. We pulled up into our van and they started walking towards us. Being completely freaked out by the scene we stumbled upon, I floored it to the next town. We told people at the next town what we had seen, and they looked at us like we had three heads. I was doing my annual road trip through New Hampshire and Vermont during the prime week for fall foliage. This trip, I invited my dad along with me in order to get him out of the house and try and ease his depression. It had rained all day long, but we finally reached a scenic waterfall. Soon as the waterfall was visible, we saw a few other people. As I looked towards the top of the waterfall, I saw an elderly man had crossed beyond the wooden guardrails and was trying to take a close picture with his little point and shoot camera. At this moment, he slipped and fell in. It was a three tiered waterfall. It was called Sabaday Falls and it was gushing literally hundreds of gallons of water per second. And I instantly screamed, Dad, someone just fell in. At this moment, the guy's head barely bobbed up from the first tier, and he was facing my direction. His nearby family and my dad hadn't seen him slip, but my scream alerted them. The guy was no longer seen again. We frantically all spread out through the course of the waterfall, looking for signs of him for the next 20 minutes. It was almost magical how we all did this instantly and effectively, without any communication as too much distance didn't permit for us to speak. Nobody could call police due to no cell phone coverage in the area. And later, 
we found out that his family did in fact see him at some point as he was being washed down. His body was found the next day by authorities. He was in his 60s as a photographer and thrill seeker. I will always be cautious now. This happened four years ago in a small town in Eastern Europe. I was 18 at the time, freshly graduated from high school. Well, our town is surrounded by woods. So if you follow a random road, there's a high chance that you will end up on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, which isn't even on Google Maps. Me and my friends were very adventurous because we were dumb teens and we had a license. So being that our town had very few and boring places to hang out, we pretty much explored all the country dirt roads. One night in August, we decided to go on a night drive to a place that we had never been to before. And we liked the fact that we had never seen a car driving there. So we could smoke, drink, blast music without disturbing anyone. We named the place the Botanical Garden, simply because it was about 20 miles away, on a road surrounded by undisturbed forests on both sides. We were two cars full with people. I was driving mine and Elena, the other. We arrived at the place at about 11 p.m. and we started doing our usual dumb things. As a matter of fact, I don't smoke and I couldn't drink since I was the driver. So I didn't think I imagined what happened next. We were just laughing like idiots when Elena turned the music volume down a little and told us to be quiet. We asked her why, but she didn't respond. She was focused on hearing something. Guys, you didn't hear that? Hear what? We asked her. She explained to us that she went a little closer to the woods and heard something like a crying woman. She was genuinely scared. I could see in her face the fear. And while I was telling her that it was most likely a fox or another animal, a few of my high and drunk friends started bluffing, screaming at whatever it was to go away, and that we would beat the shit out of it. Suddenly, we began hearing rhythmic screams 10 seconds away from each other. But what really scared me was that every scream sounded like it was getting closer to us. To be honest, I really thought that there was someone that needed help. But those screams were something scarier than something in a horror movie. And I can still hear it sometimes in my nightmares today. I know we were dumb, but we didn't move a muscle. I don't know why. We were just staring at each other and not saying anything with our scared faces. I think it was the fact that we were like 10 people. And we also had pepper spray, just in case we ran into somebody we didn't want to. The girls were the first who made a dash for the cars, followed by everyone soon. I turned my car, and as soon as my headlights came, I could see someone standing in the woods, behind a tree. It looked like a woman but she was very old and looked hunched and had some kind of walking stick. I can't remember what she was wearing, but her whole face was covered and I couldn't stay too long because my friends were screaming to floor it. So I did. We drove back to town and we stopped at a gas station for gas and to collect our thoughts. Everyone was puzzled and everyone saw the old woman. My friends in the car behind us even said that the old woman got out of the woods like she was chasing after the car. I have absolutely no idea what we saw that night. I haven't been back there at night. And we told other friends what we experienced. And a group went to see for themselves. All I say 
is that they hesitated to tell us what went down. They just told us that they were too creeped out and booked it out of there very quickly. I don't know if we saw some kind of spirit, a demented woman, or if it was a sick but well-played prank, although I do doubt that, because this place is in the absolute middle of nowhere, and no one has any business just waiting there to prank people. Hell, we still weren't sure which destination we were going to before we even got there, so it couldn't have been anyone outside our circle of friends who they told to try and play the prank on us. Not to mention the fact that we didn't see a single car, and people here don't really do these kind of things. Our folklore has many legends about spirits that haunt the woods at night. Stories that my grandma would tell me as a child, but I never believed them. I think I will never know what happened that night. And honestly, I really don't want to know. This happened when I was 16. I am now 35. My cousin moved to Phoenix, Arizona, one summer for a job. He offered to put me up for a week and buy me a bus ticket back home if I agreed to help move down. I agreed, and we headed on the 12 plus hour drive to Phoenix. The drive from Salt Lake City to Phoenix is long, dry, and boring. The town of Kanab, Utah, was an interesting stop on our way. The town is semi-famous as a popular destination for the filming of Western films. John Wayne made several films there. The town was also home to a restaurant employing one of the worst waitresses in waitressing history. The border of Arizona is not far from Kanab, and shortly after crossing it, I witnessed some scary shit. Desert was all that surrounded us, and we drove down the dark Arizona highway. An occasional truck or car or diesel appeared, but we were mostly alone. The northern portion of Arizona's highway is sprinkled with frequent Native American stores, but much of the landscape is decorated by abandoned, simply made wooden structures that used to sell handmade Native American items. One can imagine a time when these structures housed a proud, lively business. Now these abandoned structures a little more than wood coloured by poorly designed graffiti, which makes the sad, boring, lonely desert drive even more of a depressing undertake. It must have been about an hour or so after passing and stopping to pee at some dam on the Arizona-Utah border. My bad memory tells me that the visitor centre at the dam was closed so we peed in some bushes in the desert, but there's a good chance that we just decided to pee in the desert because it was easier. Either way, we peed in the desert. I was afraid to go in the desert, because I'm absolutely convinced that everything there can kill you. Between the Gila monsters and the heat, there are a ton of deadly assassins in the desert. Soon after we left the damn dam, we were driving down the now dark, scary highway. As we continued down a straight path, we saw a person walking a hundred yards or so away. The person was on the side of the road, and was heading in the same direction that we were. The second we both saw the person, my cousin asked if we should pick them up. And of course I said no. I knew my cousin was joking but I intended on immediately ending any conversation about it. As we came closer to the person, we saw that it was wearing blue jeans and a white t-shirt. Then I realised it was definitely a man. Upon realising it was a man, my cousin made a joke about not picking up the person because they were not pretty enough. I laughed, but I didn't give a shit if it were a woman, or how big her hypothetical boobs would have been. 
I would have screamed and slapped my cousin if he would have pulled the car over. About 20 feet from the man, and we saw that he was hitchhiking. As we passed the man, we looked up at him, as he did us, and we saw his face. It looked older than his body frame, much older. He had the shape of the frame of a man in his 20s, but his face looked like a man in his 80s. I stared at the man as we passed, and he stared back. I'm making deep eye contact. Obviously, the exchange lasted a brief moment, but it was impactful. We passed the man, and my cousin yelled out to him, and we cruised past. I calmed down after, and he was out of the rearview mirror. But the impact of that brief moment seemed to resonate. A couple of miles down the road, my cousin began acting strange, then quoted the Chech and Chong film up in smoke, before looking at me with a vicious stare and a joint in his mouth. This brought me out of the funk, and we pulled over to the other side of the road for a smoke break. We sat on the side of the creepy desert highway, as we listened to Rage Against the Machine and attempted to smoke ourselves into oblivion. We had planned on hanging out a little before we continued our drive, after the joint was gone. But as I watched my cousin fumble for a Zippo lighter, I noticed something scary in the rearview mirror. The creepy hitchhiker was right behind us. I was so scared I didn't know how to react. I wanted to look cool to my cousin, but I was scared to death. I remember trying to be as quiet as possible, and told my cousin what was happening. And he was so busy trying to get the poorly produced joint to light that he didn't hear me. The man walked right up to my passenger side window, and stopped, and smiled at me, and he made the roll down your window hand sign, and I screamed. And I'm not proud of myself, but I screamed really loud. I also hit my cousin and knocked the joint out of his hand. And he looked at me and yelled when he saw the old man. To this day, my cousin says he didn't scream, but he did. We take off down the road fast. About a mile or so down the road, we both calmed down and we became curious. So we decided to turn around and drive back past the man. My cousin wanted to see his face again but I felt like I had seen enough. In an attempt to be cool, I went along with the idea to turn around, and as we drove backwards towards the original spot, we saw the man again. He was still walking in the same way, and he was still on the same side of the road. He looked up at us again, and he looked scary. We both quietly yelled in the car and continued down along the road in the wrong direction for a minute or so, and eventually we turned around again. As we did, the man was still very much in sight, but in the dark of the night, he was making it more difficult to see him. As we completed the turn, and were again on the right side of the road, where the lights would have made it easier to see him, when the lights first illuminated the man, only his lower portion was visible from a distance away. But as we got closer, he disappeared and was gone. We spent another 30 minutes driving in the area. We kept a close watch on the side of the roads, and my cousin spent several minutes outside the car whilst taking a closer look into the desert. And the man was gone. I don't know what 